Okay, so let's um, let's just uh, start crystal ball gazing and looking into the future because obviously as we've talked about uh, regulations have changed uh, certain substances have been outlawed or are being outlawed so what's next in fire protection what are we looking forward to in the future maybe Peter you can pick up well when uh, when you look to, to gas your system or to the fire industry itself is a very conservative system yeah so the the innovation cycle is not like uh, in microelectronics, you know, where you have every six months totally new, brand new technologies. Uh, but what you can see when you look to the past, you can also have an outlook to the future. Um, what we can clearly see is that there is a strong aim to be more and more efficient with your system. That means when you compare Inert gases, they started with 160 bar working pressure, we are now at 300 bar. That does not mean they blow in with 300 bar into the room, no. This is just to reduce the footprint of the storage. So this is the pressure in the cylinder that will be reduced after the cylinder. So and the same goes on uh, also for other systems, make them smaller, make them more flexible, make them more efficient. From, from my perspective, uh, it's great to see alternatives coming in. Uh, you know, my background has been sprinklers, but obviously in the field of consultancy, all the other you know fire suppression systems, you know, we like to offer our clients the full choice. And what's what's really important is uh, standards and approvals. I mean, that is critical. Even the third party certification. There are a variety of schemes, and. You know the customer doesn't can't determine between, you know, for example, LPS and IFCC, X over warrant, and it's it's you know a certificate of approval is a certificate of approval, and one of the critical uh, fields for us is that the system specified is appropriate to the risk. A again, companies that only have one product will quote for, you know, the the, the project they're tendering for. And it's important that the client is aware that that system has limitations. So, you know, looking ahead, what's next in the fire industry is for us, uh, you know, for the area to be cleaned up a little. So, so I think where, where we see advances in, in fire protection, the things in respect to the way that systems become connected, you know, the internet of things, so remote services with, uh, with systems, how we're actually able in the future to connect what is fundamentally a mechanical system with the electronic side of the, uh, of the industry. So I'm thinking of, of connected systems. Um, I think that that is, is a future for the, uh, for the industry where we're, we're in a situation now where a very mechanical system requires a lot of mechanical intervention in the event that there is a cylinder that goes down on pressure or that there is some other issue with that system. I think as we move forward, I think we will see more systems that actually interface electronically with the service provider so that in the event that there is an issue, the service provider is notified, sometimes even before the user of the system, that there is actually an issue with that system and he can then put uh, extra resources in place to um, safeguard the system before the service provider arrives, but also notify the service provider so he can actually be taking the necessary equipment with him to visit the site and rectify the system as and when he arrives there. So we, we look from moving from two interventions with a system when there is a, uh, an issue to one intervention. So I think that's definitely an area where uh, we see developments moving forward, remote services and connectivity. Yeah, I think Alan, as, as you said, remote diagnostics, as it's uh, sometimes called, is, is going to definitely, definitely come to the fore. But one of the one of the items that we haven't touched on that I think is going to be vastly, vastly important is the environmental considerations. Um, environmental considerations, as we all know, there have been some very strange weather conditions around the world, and whether that is down to global warming, I think is a there's a massive debate out there about it. But I think the fire protection industry does have a part to play um, by obviously conforming to all the regulations that are out there, be it the Montreal Protocol, etc. And if we talk specifically about Novec as a product, obviously with its blue sky warranty bar that I think I've 
you can expand on somewhat. Um, it does give a guarantee that it will be in the marketplace for at least the next 20 years. Now that's quite a comfort for anybody buying a system knowing that what they are buying has got a 20 year lifespan at least because we've all seen the demise of other certain HFCs which has come as a little bit of a shock to a lot mm. of the fire protection industry and it's causing a lot of consternation so I think by working together with the industry the specifiers um, Novec as a product I think has a, a great deal to offer mm -hmm. yeah what uh, Graham is referring to is that of course, as I mentioned in the beginning, Harold was a good solution, was phased out. HFCs currently are phased down. It's not exactly the same, but the result would be that also the HFCs will disappear. So as Novak 1230 is also a chemical agent, the question automatically came, yeah, when is Novak uh, going to be phased out? So in order to, uh, to ensure the market that will never happen, because of the environmental characteristics that the agent has, it actually breaks down in five to seven days rather than being years of, of, of having years of stability in the higher atmosphere. This one breaks down in three to five in five to seven days under the influence of UV light once it gets emitted into the atmosphere. There is no risk of ozone depletion, there is no risk of impact on global warming. And just to ensure the market that that was the case, we issued a 20-year warranty that if ever there would be a regulation because something we overlooked and it is damaging the atmosphere or the environment, that warranty would kick in and the end user would be recompensated for his investment. Now, of course, we're 200% sure that that will never happen. Jose, you've been writing about this industry for about 15 years now. Um, where do you see it going in, say, the next 15 to 20? <laughs> Well, I would, I would, the environmental scrutiny side, that was one of my points, because um, I, I have to look at all fire extinguishing agents, and foam, for example, is now going through a tough time. Some, some types of foam have been, have, been, have been outlawed in places like Washington, in the US, also in, in South Australia. Um, the REACH regulations, I mean, there's, there's a lot of scrutiny on the ingredients of fire uh, fire extinguishing and fire suppression agents. I think that's going to carry on. That will continue, and as science catches up, it will. The, this scrutiny will get closer. Uh, so that's one of the, the things. But from what you're saying, you've obviously got no concerns on that side right. of things. Uh, the other, the other trend that I see. Well, I think the fire industry is, is kind of struggling a bit with the smart world out there at the moment. <laughs> we don't really know what to do. Uh, I've seen a big pharma company in the, in the US last year, almost they became too impatient with the fire industry and decided to, to launch themselves into it and started a program to try and connect some of their fire equipment with the cloud and to, and to get information about whether it was working properly um, for maintenance or for whatever reasons with the view that if there was an incident, they would be better prepared to deal with it and to share the right information with the with emergency response crews. So I think projects like that should are leading the way and organisations like the NFPA are now listening, are now developing standards in that regard. It'll probably take another 10 or 15 years to get there because this is not a fast moving world, but we will, I'm sure. There's actually one point, um, that was a bit what I was aiming at. Um, so we haven't really touched upon the necessity of detection. Maybe we're all talking now about the fire extinguishing um, system as such. But I think one of the most important aspects of that whole protection is detection. And so what we're always, and I think most of the people here advocate very strongly for, is that you always make sure that your extinguishing system is linked up with a very good, reliable detection system. So, and that is a bit, how should I say, part of that clean agent approach, because you want to make sure that you interact with whatever is developing before it becomes an issue, before it is a flame, before it really starts to create damage. And that's also, I would say, part of that aspect of clean 
so that you don't have any downtime, you don't have any cleanup work, you have no issues whatsoever. Maybe I could just um, add to that. <coughs> Historically, clean aging systems were deployed in spaces where still air existed. You know, so that you, you have a, a room, you have air handling equipment within the room, the detection system senses an incident and then shuts down the air, the air handling system. It's very different today. Modern data centers cannot exist without uh, high airflow air conditioning in place. And so what we need to do now is we need to take that into account when we're designing a system. And when we look towards the future, it may well be that the high airflows that are employed within these uh, facilities could actually be used to help with the distribution and the dispersion of the gas. Now that is something that at this stage is not developed to the point where it can be deployed and traditionally people are protecting those facilities in the very traditional way of putting discharge nozzles in each of the separate volumes. But certainly uh, as an industry this is something that is worthy of further research to actually understand whether those high air movements within these facilities can actually be used to aid the distribution of the gas within those facilities. So that is definitely a future, mm -hmm. a future consideration. I think we do need a holistic approach. Um, the, the, there's, there's various um, parties that need to be involved in design of um, fire suppression systems and the infrastructure they sit in. I mean, the, there's instances, what, what Alan's talking about there is commonly known as what's cold R containment. Now, there are various cold R containment manufacturers out there that are working in harmony with the fire suppression industry and having things such as automatic opening vents on the top of their aisles. But this is where I do feel there's a, a lot of mileage. Alan sits on various committees within the fire industry, as do I. Uh, but it's almost, the, we're talking specifically about the data centre industry here. It is a massive, massive market that is only growing and growing. But there does need to be some sort of um, consideration between all the stakeholders within that, be it the cold oil manufacturers, rack manufacturers, air conditioning manufacturers, the fire suppression industry. And that's something that I think needs to be driven somewhere in the UK, well, worldwide, that, that's not happening at the moment, unfortunately. But where, whether that will ever happen, Alan, I don't quite know. No, it's, it's a fair point, and, and I think the fire industry um, does tend to try to reach out to other interested parties, and uh, you know, certainly the data centre uh, community is very much engaged in the development of the data centre fire protection standards. You know, we've got uh, EN 50600, which is a, a data centre standard that does have sections now that include fire protection and it guides the user towards the most appropriate fire protection for those facilities. So I think there is a, a greater and perhaps expanding interaction between the fire system and the external users of those systems. I, think this, <clears throat> I mean, today we know already that there are multiple ways to detect a fire or to detect that a fire will occur. Yeah? It's not only smoke, there are also other possibilities to detect. But it's a, a very long, long winding road to bring these new methods of detection into a standard that is accepted to release a suppression system. So this is also what we are a little bit struggling with. Yeah? So we have plenty of ideas to put that to make that more smart and intelligent, but at the end, um, you are faced with an authority that says, well, this kind of detection I can't see here, I can't find. So this is for sure something we have to push more. That's also why representatives of the industry are sitting in various committees to convince them, together also with uh, I think insurance companies or consultants, to, to go more, to open more, to be more holistic in the approach, yeah, to look a little bit more left and right. So we're nearly out of time, so let's give the last word to you, Bart, um, because here we are, thanks to uh, 3M's Novec product. Um, I guess it's not a solution that's going to be for everybody, but at least you can give the reassurance that it's going to be around for the foreseeable future. Yeah. I think it's more or less fair to say that it has been the latest development, which is now already about 15 years old. 
but it is indeed not the solution for every risk. And I think it has been touched upon frequently. You need to, and that's where the consultants play a very important role, it is important to make a proper hazard and risk analysis in function of that, plus what you really want to achieve, extinguish, control, or uh, to make a decision as to what you really want, and in function of that, develop or recommend the system. Also, what I would almost always say is that if an end user wants to make that choice, please be with close to a consultant, make sure that you approach multiple suppliers because you want to avoid that somebody just will promote what he sells. It needs to be the solution that fits um, the, the end. So of course with Novak 1230 it is never going to be subject to any environmental issues. It will be there for as far as we can foresee. And I think also uh, in this context what we have done is we try to only commercialize it through companies that are fully compliant with standards, fully compliant on the design, so that we know that whatever is ultimately installed at that end user is going to do exactly what it's supposed to do. Bart Goman, thank you very much, and thank you very much for watching. We're out of time now, so I've just got time to thank my panelists, Chris, Peter, and Jose. Bart, Graham and Alan and thank you for watching and we'll see you again soon for another Industrial Fire Journal roundtable. Thank you for watching.